So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson, and I am a physician assistant and a member of the Medicating Normal team, where I volunteer doing outreach for the film and facilitating important conversations like this one. Um, today, I'm so excited to bring you this interview with Dr. Roger McPhillan. Dr. McPhillan is a licensed psychologist and executive director of the Center for Integrate Integrated Behavioral Health and host of the soon to be released, but I think it is released, and he'll tell us more about that podcast, Radically Genuine. Dr. McPhillan has extensive experience and expertise in cognitive behavioral therapies. He's board certified in behavioral and cognitive psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology and a, is it diplomat or diplomat? Okay. Of the Academy of Cognitive Therapy in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He earned his doctorate in clinical psychology from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, where he was the recipient of the Dean's Award for Academic Excellence and currently has a standing faculty appointment. Dr. McPhillan is strongly committed to the use of evidence based treatments and he specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as CBT, and dialectical behavioral therapy, which is DBT, for the treatment of post traumatic stress, eating disorders, and mood and anxiety related concerns. He specializes in working with trauma victims and people who may be experiencing multiple problems like self-injury, suicidal thinking, relationship problems, substance abuse, associated with difficulties in regulating intense emotions and moods. His areas of academic and clinical interest also reflect the advancement of safe, empirically validated frontline treatments for mental health concerns. And he is outspoken against the prescription drug culture that currently dominates mental health care. Um, if you'd like to read more about books and chapters he's authored, research project he's been involved in, his approach to therapy and his professional organization memberships, there is a link um, at the top of this live stream and there will be a link in the comment section below where you can read more about Dr. McPhillan. So thank you so much um, for joining us today. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Um, I've been stalking your Twitter a little bit, so we're going to get into um, lots of things that you talk about there. But just to start, since that was a very, you know, formal introduction, do you have anything more you'd like to say about yourself to get started? Um, any comments on on the film, Medicating Normal, because you've had a chance to watch it? Definitely. First of all, thank you for having me. I did get the opportunity to screen the film. I thought it was powerful very well done and so i do appreciate the opportunity to talk in depth about these very important issues you did mention my my twitter account and it, it tends to push people to sometimes extremes in the argument and that's just the nature of i think the twitter platform so the opportunity to, today to maybe talk in greater depth about some of my tweets which certainly are critical of the current approach to mental health care um, for me personally, I had to kind of resolve the conflict that I was observing over 20 plus years in this field, which was the, the idea that these psychiatric medications and um, the diagnostic system as currently kind of developed were very valid, uh, safe and effective means of being able to help people through suffering difficult times in their life. But what I was unfortunately seeing in front of me was quite the opposite. Um, you know, at best, we were, I was, had been, I have been and had been working with people who um, demonstrate little response to some of uh, the multiple medications they're initially placed on, but more importantly, coming across um, just a large amount of, of people who've gotten worse, um, experiencing uh, significant changes to their own quality of life from side effects to changes in physiology to taking what appears to be episodic conditions and making them almost chronic and in some cases uh, disabled. And it really forced me to take an honest look at what the scientific literature was informing us on how some of these drugs came to, came to market and how physicians are being trained and how as we as mental health professionals are 
kind of assessing and understanding how people um, struggle and how people recover. And uh, you know, I've come to the conclusion at this point in my career that it's really important for me to be more outspoken and to talk about the legitimate harms of entering into the mental health system quickly with diagnoses, multiple medications, and at the very least, be able to talk about um, the risks and the benefits in a way that people can make more informed decisions, uh, especially from an informed consent perspective. And so I do respect that people have a right to choose their own path medically and what they choose to do with their own bodies and their own health. I ultimately respect that. But I think it's really important that people understand the risks. Too many people have taken medications and entered into forms of treatment without fully understanding the long-term consequences of it. And I don't think all physicians and prescribers who are writing these scripts and making these diagnoses fully understand the consequences. And so my job right now, um, which includes running a, a large center in our region and hopefully to develop that, is to also have a greater voice through my podcast, Radically Genuine, to try to engage people through social media and to understand the stories of people who have been harmed. Because I wanna be part of a science base and I wanna be part of a mental health system that um, values the feedback from the patients we're trying to serve. And your film has, has, has done that because it, it, it's able to communicate the stories of people who've entered into system and then be able to observe the consequences, which are heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And if these stories um, become more widely publicized, those who have been harmed, we allow for them to have some sense of purpose and meaning for what they've gone through to be able to prevent and help others and from a, from a perspective of being a clinical psychologist, I'm really interested in science. And for me, science is, is evolving. It's evolving with data, it's evolving with stories. And um, we need to be able to publicize the harms of these psychiatric medications, how they're impairing evidence-based and safe treatments. And to talk about it from uh, the emotion regulation science on how people can ultimately overcome challenges, whether it's exposure to traumatic events, depressive episodes, being overcome by fear and panic, which are which all of these are the most typical presentations in, in mental health. They can lead themselves to um, feeling suicidal, abusing substances, eating problems, sleep problems. So the more that we can open up the conversation and discuss the complexity of one's mental health, which includes physical health, relationships, the community you live in, the opportunities you have, the food that you eat, um, you know, it's so complex. Uh, if we can become, if we can become more open and, and discuss both sides of every issue, then I think we can, we can examine the complexities and we can improve the science base. And so that's kind of my ultimate goal right now. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your voice in this. I think a lot of people are scared to have these conversations or they feel like it's you know out of the scope of their practice or maybe I think some people just don't know and they think they're helping people and they're actually causing harm. So I agree, it's, it's super important to have these conversations. Um, so the first question I guess is, how did you come to this place of critical thinking? I mean, I trained as a physician assistant and it took me actually taking psychiatric medications and becoming harmed by them to wake up and have this awareness. And I think a lot of people have to learn the hard way, but I'm always curious because there's not a lot of folks that just come to it on their own. So was there some personal thing that happened or how did you, how did you fall upon this topic? Yeah. So let me tell my story here. Um, and it date, dates back 20 plus years, my first job outside of undergrad, and this is before I even had any intentions of becoming a psychologist, was at a children's psychiatric hospital on a unit with kids as young as age five to as old as age 10. And this was 1999, 2000, 2001. And it was really the height of 
Um, this idea that mental health, mental illness is a brain related illness. And what was rampant at the time, and unfortunately is still rampant today, is the idea that um, when somebody is presenting with psychiatric symptoms or in crisis, that there is an underlying brain abnormality or chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. And these drugs were brought to market to be able to correct that chemical imbalance and therefore provide stability. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first exposure was on this unit. And overwhelmingly the kids that were in crisis who were entered into these psychiatric hospitals were victims of neglect, violence, and um, you know, sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So you would see what you would expect to see when they entered into the hospital. They were in a state of acute stress and they were aggressive. They, they were, could have been on either end of the spectrum. So aggressive on one end to extreme withdrawal and disassociating on, on another. And so even as an untrained, just staff counselor at that time, just from a human perspective, you just, you saw that these were kids who were victims of abuse and neglect, and they were reacting accordingly based on the environment. So there was distrust. Mm -hmm. um, and what you were taught as a counselor was that in order to maintain control over the unit, um, these kids, if they would act out physically or become emotionally dysregulated, you would put them in restraints or holds and then walk them off the unit and into what was called like a timeout room or a safe room. Um, I was 21 years old. I was a former college football player. Um, the idea of me putting my hands physically on kids who've been abused was very aversive to me. Um, because what that created was a strong reaction in them, almost as if they were going to be hurt or harmed again. Yeah. And it was, it was an intrusive way of trying to manage a unit. Mm -hmm. And I've always been somebody who questioned authority. So um, I always want to know why. And uh, you may be a psychiatrist or a head psychiatrist on the unit. I was a 21 year old kid, but I was asking questions, why? Why are we putting them in these holds? Um, why are they being placed on all these medications? Three, four, five, and I can get into what I observed. Mm -hmm. um, but to back to the back to the holds, I decided I wasn't going to do it. Right? I I might have had to carry a kid out to a timeout room, but when I was out there, I'd sit out there and I would just say, "I'm not going to hurt you. As soon as you calm calm down, we can talk." Yeah. And what that would mean is they would initially hurt me. They would kick me, they would punch me, but they were as old as nine years old, right? They couldn't hurt me. So I would sit there and I would be non-defensive. Mm -hmm. And once they found out that I was safe, I had this control in the unit by just my words. Just my words was able to de-escalate a situation. Now we had behavior modification techniques. There was a one, there was a two, there was a three. But I inherently knew at that time that the way that they were reacting or responding was just a safety mechanism. They were, they were just overcompensating, trying to test out their environment, defending themselves. And when I became safe, they would actually cuddle up next to me and we would talk about what just happened that provoked that anger or that response. And I could, we could just talk about how you can respond better. And then I would praise that all the time in the unit. So this was just natural to me at the time. And at the same time, you would, we, we'd see these kids being placed on all these medications. And what you would see is what you expected. Um, they would become highly sedated. Um, they, were, they came in lively, um, obviously, and they left very sedated. Um, sometimes sleeping 16 hours a day, we couldn't wake them up. Um, others would experience these horrific side effects, tardive dyskinesia, acastasia. To see a child go through that was horrific. And because I had some of the success that I did in just managing the unit with the approach that I said, I told you, I was kind of promoted to this idea of like chief counselor and able to go into these, um, what were called treatment team meetings. And in these treatment team meetings, I was exposed to kind of the hierarchy that existed within that medical establishment. 
and it was the child psychiatrist Ruldahl. Um, underneath him were nurses and social workers, and no one would question anything that this gentleman would say. So I observed this because they were viewing um, sedated children to be responding and now stabilized. And so I challenged this and mm -hmm. I asked questions regarding safety, efficacy, accurate diagnosis, how people, like I was just curious, constantly curious. I think you get into this field based on two things. I think one, if you're gonna be good at it, you care deeply about people mm -hmm. and you wanna help them. And then two, there's that intellectual curiosity and that helps drive trying to learn how to help somebody. And the conclusion that I was drawn to at that time is I don't think they really know what they're doing. This, this is experimental. Yeah. And um, it was experimental in nature and the hierarchy or the, um, the way that the hierarchy was established kind of maintained that power structure. So there's things on my Twitter, I'll write no more bystanders. And that's what I mean by bystanders. It's people who are just fitting themselves into the hierarchy who believe it's outside of their scope to be able to challenge that hierarchy. And the problem I have with this, Nicole, is that most of, you know, most of mental health professionals and counselors, social workers, psychologists, so forth, we're just recommending our clients to go and get evaluated by a physician for medication as if it's just standard course. Mm -hmm. So if you have the if you have the power to be able to recommend these medications as standard course, well, then you have a, a professional responsibility to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what took me through the literature. And I remember I eventually decided to become a, a, a psychologist and enter a doctoral program. And I remember it was in 2008, which I was, um, you know, I think in my fourth or fifth year at that point, there was a a study that came out that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that spoke about publication bias uh, in SSRIs, antidepressants, and pretty much stated that they're just placebos with side effects. The, the naive person I was at the time expected to go home and watch that on the nightly news. You know, this is, wow, this study identified antidepressants to be nothing more than a placebo. I was observing side effects, poor response in my clinical training, in my practicum sites, in my previous settings. Um, this is the opportunity, right? Like we can really begin to examine this. Heard nothing of it. I couldn't even find it in the mainstream news. Right. And when I brought it up within my educational system or, or, or practicum sites at that time, it was easily dismissed, right? Like we're, we're almost we're led to believe that this is some advancement in society. And it almost went unquestioned. It still goes unquestioned. If you look at the statistics, they are in incredibly rising, the amount of people that are going on uh, SSRIs for one and psychiatric medications, as if there's no harm. And as if we just expect them to have stability. So my, you see my process has been over the course of, of 20 years yeah. And when I begin to understand um, like processes of change in cognitive behavioral therapy and treatments like exposure and reading on evolutionary biology and trying to understand um, what are the mechanisms of action in safe and effective behavioral treatments, like how do we treat PTSD? What has to happen and why? Or anxiety disorders? Or how do we learn to regulate mood? You know, I became really intrigued in just how we learn and how we evolve and adapt. And it seemed very clear to me that the two approaches, what I was trying to provide in therapy, and then what the, the messages they were getting within the system from the medical side of things were contradictory. Mm -hmm. So I'm exposing my clients to feared stimuli, memories, emotions. I'm encouraging their ability to be able to tolerate, regulate that, make decisions, because we're trying to make profound changes in learning. And on the other hand, they're getting this mixed message that says, here, take this pill. What you're experiencing is a, an underlying imbalance and that you require this pill and your emotions that you're experiencing. Well, those are too intense or those are too dysregulated, you're disordered. And that was 
not in any way um, improving my outcomes. Right. And not to mention that I was also observing the long-term effects of being on various psychiatric medications, which you know well of, and many of our audience members do today as well. So, I mean, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but that's kind of been my evolution to where I am now. Mm -hmm. And I've been knee deep in the literature probably for the past five to 10 years to try to understand what is going on because initially, you ask yourself, what am I missing? You know, if I'm on the outside, everyone else, including medical professionals are so freely prescribing all these drugs, then I have to be missing something, right? And th that's when I got exposed to, um, you know, psychiatrists who we've been critical mm -hmm. and looking at greater depth into the science and reading books like Anatomy of an Epidemic and watching your film and it's kind of um, evolved where I created for our practice just a position statement mm -hmm. on um, at least SSRIs for children, adolescents, and young adults. Um, because that is where I'm very clear that we don't have any safe or effective science to support that population to be placed on those drugs, but yet it's increasing. So we're taking a stance here and then I also, a few months ago, began to become much more um, public about my views mm -hmm. um, through different media, and including, and that's brought me here today. Wow. Well, I, I respect you even more now after hearing that because a lot of people, I mean, it just means that you think critically and that you, you used that curiosity to figure this out on your own and that doesn't happen very often, at least in from the people that I've spoken to. A lot of us just, uh, I'll speak for myself, being in my 20s, I mean, you were young when you when you launched into your career. And at that age, too, you're especially like a sponge. I think a lot of people just naively uh, accept that what they're being taught is truth and then just sort of regurgitate stuff instead of really really thinking about it. And so it's clear that you did and you discovered this on your own, which is pretty cool. Um, you talked about some just in your last answer about therapists, um, you know, recommending or and psychologists recommending their clients to psychiatry, but then not really understanding um, what they're recommending. And I'm just thinking back um, to my own experience that was what happened to me. I was seeing a therapist, but it was like a requirement that you had to have a psychiatrist. And it, looking back in hindsight, they're in the same practice. So both of them are billing me at the same time. And I'm wondering if you think that that's like purposeful, that it's they set it up that way so they can sort of double dip your insurance, bill you twice. They have this like team approach um, to, to treating the person, but it also involves you, you have to take medication in order to, to see me as a therapist and to see the psychiatrist in this practice together. And then also why, when the clients or the patients are getting um, medication from the psychiatrist, don't you think therapists recognize that you know, it, it could impair the client's ability to like have real genuine emotion, which then impairs being able to benefit from therapy. Like, why isn't that considered at all? It's a really good question. And so it, it does go back to your, your question on, on critical thinking and critical thought, because with these if these questions were asked, investigated, and were part of the training and educational system, I don't think we have the problems that we currently do. Mm -hmm. So your your answer, your question is, is complicated and it's very difficult for me to just speak about the intentions of, of others. At the same time, I wanna be realistic. Um, we absolutely see the financial conflicts of interest that exist with first pharmaceuticals brought to market mm -hmm. because we, we do see how data was manipulated um, for financial gain and how the marketing departments of pharmaceutical companies influence uh, the physicians. Academic ghostwriting, um, 
paying academics and physicians to promote their drugs, which influence the practitioners. But this really runs deep because there is this prevailing myth that's not supported by science is this idea that therapy combined with medication yield the best outcomes. Mm -hmm. And you can deconstruct that um, pretty quickly within the literature and the studies. And if you, if you are curious and you are a critical thinker, mm -hmm. you eventually turn yourself to history and evolutionary biology and how people recover. And exactly what you said was that our emotions are gifts given to us throughout evolution and, and we need to pay attention to them, even though if we feel them intensely and they're painful, on the other side of that tends to be wisdom and learning. Um, they can get us out of tremendously challenging, difficult and even abusive situations. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the inherent resilience of all people Mm -hmm. That's not to minimize or deny that there are conditions and mental illness that we don't even fully understand, like schizophrenia, psychotic episodes, and there may be situations for people where uh, a psychiatric drug induces and changes and alters a state that can be stabilizing in that particular moment. And I do view them as emergency medicine. Um, and so I don't want to go all or nothing because I think there's situations that they could improve the lives maybe temporarily for some people in some situations. But those situations are statistically rare and historically rare. Mm -hmm. But your, your point that the need, your need to be able to feel the emotions, expose yourself to them and learn about them in a way to both heal and to regulate those emotions to to make better decisions in your own life and to solve problems is a necessary co component of safe and effective therapies. Why don't mental health therapists understand this? Because they're not critically thinking, because they're doing what they are told or they're part of a system and they're just a cog within that system. Um, the idea of mandating somebody from therapy to go into um, to psychiatric drugs or psychiatric drugs into therapy doesn't seem to me to be an effective means of healthcare. Um, instead, we should be understanding all the factors that are influencing why someone is experiencing what they're experiencing and develop a treatment plan in combination collaboratively with that person to be able to target all those factors. And it should be done safe. We should rely on a scientific approach in being able to determine what that person is going through. And it should occur with the utmost respect for their autonomy. And my experience within the system, it does not do that. People who are struggling are marginalized and therefore um, the system has become more about monitoring. So that psychotherapy that that person is receiving and those drugs are not necessarily in my mind treatment. They're just some form of monitoring to a marginalized population. And one of the things that I've you know, tweeted and I'm outspoken about is we don't need more mental health professionals. We need a, um, a greater depth of investigation study and leaders within the field who are going to compassionately protect the welfare of those clients who are trusting professionals to help them through a difficult time. And in a system where we are turning episodic conditions into chronic disability, without us being able to take an honest look about why that is happening, we don't evolve as a field. And it does start on the education component of this, uh, social workers, master's level therapists. If they are still being taught the chemical imbalance myth, and drugs are designed to correct and stabilize it, we're steps backwards, right? 30 years behind that, but it's still being taught. And I don't know what other way to address these problems than to be vocal about it. And in some points to be aggressive about it and to call it out um, because I'm more than willing to enter into this debate with anybody. 
-hmm. whether you're an academic professor, you're a psychiatrist, you're a medical professional, I reach out to these people who are making comments on my Twitter to come onto my podcast and let's have a professional discussion about it. Right. And um, unfortunately, up to this point, no one's been willing to do that. Um, but if science is going to evolve, well, those questions, these conversations are critical. If there's another perspective you want to share and there's another side to this, let's have it respectfully. Right. Um, but I don't want to be a field, be part of a field that's muting the voices of people who are getting worse. Mm -hmm. um, and we're actually marginalizing and minimizing their stories. Right. Um, so let's get into some of your tweets. There's, we'll start with the one pinned on top of your page. You say, it pains me to say this given I'm a clinical psychologist. I firmly believe the greatest predictor of a lifelong struggle with mental illness other than untreated PTSD is entering into the mental health system as it's currently constructed. I'm a clinical psychologist and I would never recommend a family member enter into the mental health system as currently constructed. That's interesting to me because I always thought like, I wonder if, you know, the people defending these medications, like psychiatrists defending the medications would, if you ask them, would they give them to their own child or someone in their family? If, what the honest answer to that question would be. But um, going back to your tweet, why do you think entering the current mental health system keeps people trapped lifelong? And why, why never, such a strong word, would you ever recommend somebody? Yeah, good question. I mean, that, that tweet that I put out there um, has garnered some strong opinions, both positive and negative, and it's designed to have this conversation that I want to have right now. Yeah. Um, first of all, the, the people who are seeking out mental health support and treatment are our brothers, our sisters, they're our veterans, they're our colleagues, right? If there's a collective humanity, that, that exists and we care about people in our lives, then, then we must have great empathy and compassion to people who are, are struggling. And that's from a societal perspective. So you asked a question and I've asked the same thing. Would these psychiatrists who are writing out these prescriptions, sometimes three, four, five, absolutely experimental, would they do that to their own family member? Mm -hmm. So it becomes an ethical question. And, you, and when I talked about the hierarchy, and how you view people who are struggling with their mental health, if you're viewing them as ill or you're viewing them as disordered, well, almost anything that they share with you can be construed or misconstrued through the lens of somebody who is psychiatrically ill. Mm -hmm. So that can invalidate their own experience. So what is the mental health system as currently constructed? Well, first it's a diagnostic system that is broad, that isn't scientifically valid, that doesn't differentiate one person from another person for the next. So they're not these discrete illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, almost anybody could meet a criteria at any given time within the population, depending on how it's communicated. So you are you are utilizing a person's verbal representation of their experience in a time when they're in distress. And then you're identifying it with a label as if it's a discrete medical illness that may require or does require lifelong treatment. Okay. And since that's been part of um, our society, what do the numbers suggest? Mm -hmm. Well, I can just tell you, cause I did this research this morning, it's been about a thousand fold increase in depression since Prozac was brought to market in 1988. So what has been traditionally um, episodic conditions for the overwhelming majority of people or responses to events that would be considered normal given what they've been exposed to, we have now medicalized the human experience and entered them into a form of treatment that has poor efficacy, um, poor safety, significant side effects, um, and 
at this point, we don't even know what they originally were entering in for treatment for because they've been drugged multiple times, been provided ineffective therapy, the assessment's been poor, the overall treatment's been poor. And so what is typical, and sometimes before people get into my office, five, six, seven different therapists, four, five, six different psychiatrists or medical professionals, drug after drug after drug after drug. And then you just see the continued impairment, um, sleeping, waking, se sexual dysfunction, akesthesia. Um, and so the cure has become the disease. So when I say I could never enter a, I could never recommend a family member enter into the system. That's my way of communicating um, through Twitter that somebody who's deeply tied to me, who I would care about, how could I do the same thing to somebody else who um, is struggling and, and suffering? And if I uh, and if I did, that makes me a hypocrite. And how would I become that detached from humanity? Mm -hmm. And then that's part of the concern is the level of detachment from humanity that we see within the system. So we talk about at our center is everyone is, it should be treated like a family member where you're biologically tied to. Um, and we measure outcomes and we take our time and it's collaborative and evaluations are over weeks, not 15 minutes. So that is what is the mental health system as currently constructed, a 15 minute interview and a prescription. Yeah. And we see the statistics, they're overwhelming. People are worsening. What science field or what health field um, in time worsens without critical analysis and public critical analysis. Right. So for speaking out on Twitter, you know, as vocally as you have and about such controversial topics um, as this one, do you get a lot of pushback from people? If so, what, what are some of the arguments against some of the things you're saying? And then also have any of your colleagues, you know, supported you either publicly or, you know, behind the scenes, do you get little messages like, yeah, I agree with you, but, you know, but they're not saying so publicly. Yeah, great question. Let's first, the, the first part here is um, what is my, what is the reaction to Twitter? So mm -hmm. first of all, I'm very early in this. I just really started tweeting in, in April. Um, so my following is increasing, which tells me that there are people that are interested in the subjects. Um, and then um, I do get a number of people who will call me out as being incompetent, spreading misinformation, um, dangerous. And the rationale for that is one, um, I'm a psychologist, not a medical professional. So that ultimately means that I have no capacity or ability to read the scientific literature or understand the stories of people who are being harmed or have the depth of knowledge to be able to try to understand exactly what's going on, which, you know, that just ends the argument. So you're not actually, you're not actually debating my points. You're putting me down as the messenger, which is exactly what happens to the patients who are harmed. And yeah. that's the hierarchy I'm referring to. And that's, that's a problem, number one. The other one is the idea that, uh, that tweets are medical advice, right? Stop, making, stop providing medical advice, you're dangerous. And, and there's two problems with that. One, tweets are not medical advice. And if you're going to provide, um, if you're gonna provide strong opinions or statements and you're going to refer to science and literature, and I'm not alone in this. Obviously, there are physicians out there who are saying the same thing that I'm saying. Yeah. Um, the this is this is about this is about communicating um, and connecting with the greater field, and Twitter allows you to do that. It's not certainly not medical advice, but it's also I wouldn't say it's outside my boundary of competence. I'm a clinical psychologist in the field of mental health. I have a doctorate in my field, and I'm working with these patients day to day. So I stand by what I'm what I'm what I'm posting. And in fact, if more people who were making the recommendations for uh, psychiatric medication had a more thorough understanding of the exact mechanisms and the history and what these drugs actually do, I think we'd save people's lives. 
So those, those are two major things that are, uh, that come out. The third one is people who are saying that psychiatric medications saved their life, right? Which this is where the human side of me um, wants to support that person. If you believe what you're taking is helping you in some way, please continue to do that. Um, I'm being, I'm not necessarily being critical of you and your choice to take those, that medicine, because you're working under the um, recommendations of, of a physician. And I respect your individual rights. Mm -hmm. And this idea of pill shaming, which is the other aspect about this, just stops the argument and just maintains the abuse that happens out there. So um, this is why we have science, right? Um, because I can believe that um, my daily coffee every day gives me superhuman abilities to be able to understand things that other people don't understand. It doesn't necessarily mean that's true. I can take a magic Tic Tac and say, this protects me from depression today. And if I feel good, I can continue to take the magic Tic Tac. That doesn't necessarily mean the Tic Tac is improving how I'm feeling. That's why there's value in randomized, um, double blind clinical control studies. And so I am critically trying to understand and analyze those double blind studies as well as understand what I'm seeing in clinical practice. And so that's what I'm that's what I'm communicating. And what we know, and let's just take the simple one, the SSRIs, there's going to be a percentage of people who are going to have a strong placebo response. Right. And um, that's powerful in society. And so from an ethical perspective, I've had private conversations with psychiatrists who understand that and then will actually say that's for the betterment of the individual. To me, that's an ethical violation because I believe in your right to informed consent. And no one has that power to make that decision. You don't have that power to make that decision over my health care. You give me the information and I make a decision. You don't withhold information for my betterment or what you believe to be my betterment. Yeah. The other uh, question I want to address is how do my colleagues um, kind of take what I'm saying and how do they support this and, and so forth. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of my colleagues at my center are gonna watch this, this video, if not live, they're gonna watch it when it's posted. Mm -hmm. um, they understand and believe in what I'm saying. They need, needed a lot more education on it. We're providing it here we're building up their skills to be able to have these conversations with physicians and with, with patients, but they are also um, subjected to the same education, misinformation, marketing, cultural ideas that everyone else has. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a lot of convincing and a lot of education, which many of them are afraid to be out spoken because they're they're not confident yet that they can have the arguments that I'm having right now. And like I said, this is 20 years in the making for me. So I've put the time in where I at least feel I can articulate this with you or with clients or with professionals without intimidation. Um, I think mental health professionals who aren't medically trained are not willing to have that conversation because they don't believe they can articulate it well enough. Yeah. Well, and this might be a silly question, but um, clearly, did you get any education in your psychology training about all of these things that we're talking about today and what medicating normal is about? Was there any training whatsoever? No, in fact, I got the wrong information, right? I remember a biological basis of, of mental health conditions course that, you know, obviously, the influence of pharmaceutical companies and academics was playing itself out right there, still talking about correcting underlying brain abnormalities. So there was this in decades of research money that was devoted to trying to identify mental illness as a brain-based condition. It's abandoned now, right? It, it, it ended up being 
no direction to move in terms of like advancing the conversation. In fact, it's it's done indelible harm. So when you when you you don't ever want to say in science that you're wasting money or you're wasting fun, funding, but it wasted money and it wasted funding, mm -hmm. and it harmed people. Mm -hmm. And this is what concerned me from an ethical standpoint and just being a human. There should be a standard of safety first before you make the recommendations. Everything was backwards in mental health. They created these drugs that in the short term may have had some psychiatric benefit. Maybe it's the blunting of emotion or some numbing or a sedative effect. And then they moved backwards trying to figure out what was happening. And that's when they went off with the chemical imbalance theory. Mm -hmm. And that has taken them, taken us here to 2021 where we're still having these, this conversation. Yeah. Um, and although psychiatry is trying to move away from um, kind of their original sin here with, with chemical imbalances and, and they're trying to adopt or discuss a bio psycho social model, the truth is practice. They're still based on that same theory. Like the clinical practice is still based on categorical DSM diagnosis from a medical model and drugs that were originally designed to restore a chemical imbalance. So that's still here. That's still the predominant approach to mental health care. Yeah. Um, so in another tweet, you talk about like lack of sun size, a diet that typically, especially in America, consists of like processed garbage, seed oils, chemicals. Um, so I'm curious if you yourself um, adhere to a specific type diet or lifestyle um, and what do you recommend to your clients around those kind of things? And also I probably maybe in my naive years when I was not as critically thinking as you were, hear those things and think like, oh, you know, one of those people who thinks that like eating a certain way can can help, you know, someone's mental condition. So many people just kind of poo poo that kind of talk where um, now that I'm more educated and I've lived this myself, I've see, you know, how much these things are just like the cornerstones of um, not just mental health, health, because it's all, you know, intertwined. So what do you promote as far as, um, lifestyle if there's any specific one yeah really good question and and first i would have been the same way a decade ago and um i don't want to invalidate people um to say that your experience when if you're really struggling it's mm -hmm. you're going to completely change that based on some lifestyle factors right. um you know if i'm working with a rape victim who's in acute stress and ptsd it doesn't matter how much sun this individual gets or exercise, that doesn't change what happened to that person. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna allow somebody to go to the opposite end of the extreme on that argument like Twitter. So I wanna say that um, up front. But with that being said, there are foundations of health mm -hmm. and we cannot expect to feel good unless those building blocks and foundations are there. And what we are observing society as a whole, especially American society, um, we are getting more and more sick. And if you're physically sick, you're going to be mentally unwell. Right. Um, so when I start to talk about, I want to open up the conversation about mental health. The way it is right now is restricted and limited. Yeah. Um, so I believe in certain things that are necessary for my well being that I do myself. And I think that are necessary for the well being of others. I started my psychology career as a psychologist, research and treatment of eating disorders. So you just see, you see the psychiatric consequences of nutri nutrient deprivation right there. And, um, you know, if you're working with an underweight anorexic client, they will exhibit all different kinds of psychiatric symptoms from obsessive compulsive disorder to depressed mood, high anxiety, panic, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And just the act of restoring their weight with food resolves the condition, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that human beings, when they are deprived mm -hmm. of 
nutrients, exercise, movement, sun exposure, um, and are provided foods that are inflammatory, um, disease creating, and you're nutrient deficient because of those, there are psychiatric symptoms that, that exist. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, profess myself to be an expert in that area because I, I am a scholar. I'm just, I'm, I'm interested in that. Mm -hmm. And I experience, I experience it myself. I experiment myself. So I know that if I'm not meditating, if not, if I'm not exercising the winter months, the type of foods I eat, uh, they affect me, how I feel, my quality of sleep, my ability to stay focused, especially doing the work that I do. I sometimes can have like six, seven um, sessions, which could be eight to nine hours. And my ability to stay connected to the person in front of me and focused is different based on how I started my day or what I did that day. Mm -hmm. So it's to speak to the complexity of, of mental health. And I do think there's a lot of um, financial conflict of interest that exists within the American society. Mm -hmm. um, these chemically based foods, plastics. Um, I wanna look at what are the most nutrient dense foods that, that exist. And I focus my diet on metabolic health and nutrient density. And that's driven me to eating grass fed beef and fish and uh, organic fruit and, and limited amount of, of vegetables. And that's what allows me to feel, feel good. I believe in all likelihood that our genetic backgrounds and histories differ. So like where, where our ancestors grew, uh, uh, developed from uh, different parts of the country, we needed to our bodies to adapt to what the food sources are. So for me in particular, I can't really eat too many vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, I feel bad. Uh, I have a, a reaction, but I'm, I, if I don't have red meat or if I don't have beef, my mood is impacted. So I see the impact of food and mood with me in particular, while another person, it might be something different. So I haven't gone to the point where I'm making that level of a recommendation to go on like a carnivore diet or so forth, mm -hmm. but nutrient dense whole foods really, really matter. Um, and exercise matters. And the sun is our life force from vitamin D levels to boosting immunity to melatonin, regulating sleep. It is our life force. And at different times of the year, you see that people can be very susceptible to like depressive conditions and low mood and, 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 and so forth. And then the, the other thing that I think is critically important is sense of purpose and meaning. Um, so if we're talking about foundations of health, I don't know how you live well in this life unless you have a, a purpose and you have a meaning that's attached to everything you do, whether that's being a parent or in the work that you do, or it's through service, um, a grandparent. It doesn't, sometimes it doesn't matter what your conditions are, the conditions you grew up in. I, I was telling a story on another podcast early in my, in my career while I was going through my doctoral program, I was had a master's and then I was working in home in areas of poverty. And I was working with often, you know, teenagers who were experiencing emotional behavioral, pro behavioral problems. And there was a grandmother I came across um, whose purpose and meaning was to raise her granddaughter. Now her two daughters, one was who was the mother of this child were lost to, to drug addiction. Mm -hmm. And she had a horrific history of of poverty, of loss, but her resiliency was something that I hold on to today. And the purpose and that she attached to raising her daughter made her the most optimistic and um, energized and influential person that I've been around. And that influenced me on how I want to approach people too. So when I think about health and mental health, the foundations have to be there on how we, our, our nutrition, our, our diet, our exercise, our exposure to nature, our exposure to sun and purpose uh, and meaning attached to our life. And so if those things are not there, the idea of trying to find it somewhere else to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And the idea of trying to solve it with a pharmaceutical set, a pharmaceutical even makes less sense to me. Yeah, I mean, how 
amazing would that pill have to be to solve all those problems, right? <laughs> It would be it would be magic and yeah. you know we'd see a completely different society than what we do today but a lot of people still believe in magic unfortunately so um what are your thoughts on like all especially with the pandemic that we've all been through these sort of telehealth online medication management things that are popping up um all over the place do you think people can really get good care and then as uh, you know, our kind of final question leading into that, what is good care? Because you tweet and you say, you know, you, you think there are safe and compassionate and science-based um, things that we can people. So what are the answers if it's not our current setup that we have? Yeah, let's talk about the response to the pandemic. In some ways it's gonna revolutionize the way healthcare is delivered. And I think we have to be critical of that. Um, I think in the past four to, well, actually the probably the last 12 months, I've had four or five um, large um, capital equity-based firms trying to purchase my practice. Wow. So what is, what is that telling me and what is that telling other people? Mental health is a business mm -hmm. and they're trying to capitalize on that business. Now we know the, the marketing approach from pharmaceutical companies have tried to capitalize on the on the on mental health related problems in, in society and influenced or try to increase the degree in which we even identify them in order to expand the use of their medications. The same thing is going to happen with telehealth. So be aware of the sharks who are going to be circling to try to benefit off of a person's pain and struggle. So you're so in my opinion, um, on one end of the spectrum, um, when healthcare can be delivered by a competent, trained and compassionate professional in a way that's aligned with best practices scientifically, we can improve the, the well-being and the delivery of, of good sound treatments. Mm -hmm. On the other end, you are now just going to increase the availability of poor treatments. We did a podcast today where we were talking about um, really just the efficacy of SSRIs and its impact on, on society. And right now you can easily get on any kind of company, answer a few questions and get um, psychiatric drugs sent to your home. Right. That's not an advancement in, in healthcare. That's wow. going to harm society. Mm -hmm. That's gonna create more dependence, both psychologically and physically. We're gonna create more harms, which from a model perspective is gonna create more business and that's the problem with the mental health care system. You know, it is, it is keeping people in a system for life that is allowing people to set up their, um, to set up their careers and to maintain their careers and their lifestyle. So your job, if you're going to be good at what you do, you are not to create patients for life. You are to create um, independent um, individuals who've developed the skills to cope effectively with the problems that exist in their life. And that's a good transition to what is effective mental health care. Mm -hmm. It has to have a few components. Um, the first part is it has to have some scientific way of examining all the factors that influence and maintain problems. And that is a prolonged evaluation. That is not just sitting in front of somebody one hour a week or 45 minutes a week. It's a process. So what I'm doing and my colleagues are doing is we're putting people on apps and self-monitoring and we're gathering information. We're gathering them, they're rating their mood. They're identifying prompting events or situations that occur that lead them to feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. We're trying to understand what would lead them to binge eat or purge, to self-injure, to feel suicidal, to feel depressed, to not get out of bed, to have a panic attack you name it. So we're bringing attention to that in a science-based empirical way. And then we're collaboratively talking about what needs to happen within their life in order to make changes. And I think from a research perspective, for those who are researchers out there in the mental health field, they've already done a great job of starting to identify certain mechanisms of change. Um, that leads people to, to heal 
Mm -hmm. um, like one of them is the idea of, let's just talk about how we've advanced trauma focused treatments is the exposure to the trauma related memories and the emotions, mm -hmm. because we have the capacity to um, experience those emotions, consolidate those memories, learn and improve our ability to tolerate the distress associated with it. And then understand the complexity of how someone responded to a trauma event and understand where they become stuck in their recovery because about 20% of people exposed to a, a traumatic event develop PTSD symptoms. So many don't, mm -hmm. and there's a reason they don't because of the way they've coped. And that can be complex, right? That can include su social support systems, things we've talked about before, purpose, meaning, the willingness that person has to grieve what has happened to them, to find um, community for others who the same things have happened. And we can understand like exposure to, um, to emotions and learning to tolerate and regulate emotions is incredibly important. Um, so you have support, you have skills to regulate emotions, tolerate distress, live in the here and now, seek out supports, overcome problems. You are developing a person's skill to become their own therapist and to respond. And I think that is safe. And I think that is effective care. Mm -hmm. And there can be many different modes of delivering that. The, tr the traditional, you know, psychotherapy hour is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the reasons I'm attracted to dialectical behavior therapy is the skills training groups, which we can now provide online, and the in-moment telephone coaching consultation. So um, I might sit, some, sit with somebody for four or five therapy sessions, and the most effective intervention that took place was 15 minutes on a phone call, you know, at 930 at night on a Saturday, right. because it was in that moment that they needed me and we could take everything we've been talking about to apply it. Mm -hmm. But that's not widely provided. That's right. not mental health care. And people aren't even willing to provide that. Mm -hmm. They have their office hours, their once a week, if you can come in, you have your 15 minutes with your, your psychiatrist. That's not going to be effective. And so that's where we need to advance, you know, what our care looks like. Now, there's mental health professionals probably who are out there and, and say, wow, I mean, that's taking way too much of a commitment on my time to be able to do that. Right. And I can understand why you would think that way. But I've been now doing it for a lot of years. And I'll tell you what, like a text and a response and a call, which happens a few times a month, potentially, can be powerful. Mm -hmm. And if you're setting up therapy that is allowing people to do things every single day, and not just that hour in your session, mm -hmm. you're going to improve gains, you're going to make gains. Now, does that mean that's the solution to for everybody? No, I definitely don't want to come across and say that's the solution to everybody. That's why we need to evolve the science. That's why we need to continue to have complex conversations and we have to learn who's not responding, why, what's happening. What are societal factors? Mm -hmm. You know, what are things that are outside the control of the treatment, but are, um, you know, related to the way that we, we currently live. And then we can also, you know, if we continue to um, improve biological research, which I think is the, one of the sins of this entire thing is that we don't advance biological research. How much do we, you know, we have to be, uh, we have to be humble about what we don't know because history informs us of that. And yeah. at some point we might look back and say, oh, this is an undiagnosed illness, a virus that's undiscovered and it's created this symptom and that symptom. We don't know that, yeah. right? Um, cause we, cause we haven't advanced ourselves medically enough. And so if we stop the conversation on mental health, we're also stopping investigation. And so that's why I think all of this is complex. Um, what I do is what, what I know and to be the most effective, to be the most safe, um, but it's not gonna solve every, it's not gonna solve every um, you know, concern or problem that exists out there. But I, I think it significantly improves the outcomes of what the, the current system is. Yeah. So uh, we have a comment from the audience. They said, I love this guy. I want him in my ball court. Thank you for your compassion, knowledge, and wisdom. It's pretty good. <laughs> that, that's very kind, and I you know, thank you for that comment. 
Yeah. Um, and um, I, and I think I, that brings up a point, like I, when people are out there with the, seeking out mental health care, um, one of the questions you always have to ask yourself is how invested is that person in, in me and in my success? And there's a lot of great people out there. And even if you've had poor care at, at a certain time, um, I don't want that to be overgeneralized. You know, you find the right person because that matters. Yeah, that makes me think of my cousin was telling me something about seeing a therapist. And he said like, oh, I just feel like sometimes so many that you see, you just, you can tell that they're just there because they're being paid to be there. And it doesn't feel like they really care, you know, or want to be there. So that's a really important point that you make. Okay, I'm aware of the time, the hour that we had just kind of flew by. So I wanna give you an opportunity before we go, if you have any closing thoughts and certainly um, let everybody know where they can find you, um, you know, where your office is, your website, definitely your podcast, because I'd like to know about that as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, um, you know, a couple things about who I am. I'm a clinical psychologist and I am the executive director and a, and a treating psychologist at Center for Integrative Behavioral Health, which is in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in the United States. Um, we specialize in, in cognitive and dialectical behavior therapies applied to the individual. It's an active skill-based treatment. Um, one of the messages that I wanna to communicate to people of what you are experiencing and what you've gone through is complex and it deserves the time to be thoroughly evaluated. And we wanna be very careful of quick diagnosis and just prescriptions. And we want to be able to understand how these drugs create great harms. Mm -hmm. um, but give yourself the time to understand what you're going through in, in context. And I, I do believe that there are safe frontline treatments that, that exist. I'm gonna to try to um, advance the conversation you know, you can find me um, on Twitter. Um, I can't even remember what my, my Twitter hashtag is or whatever. We'll, we'll put it in the comments for people watching. But we've also started a, a, a podcast to be able to express, you know, some of the things that I talked about today. And that podcast is the Radically Genuine Podcast. Mm -hmm. So it is right now we have three episodes that are on Spotify and Amazon. We're just waiting for the approval on um on Apple podcast, which is, you know, any day. You could also go to our website, which is www.center, C-E-N-T-E-R, for ibh.com, F-O-R-I-B-H, which is integrated behavioral health.com. And our podcast is there, you can access it then. And um, I do want to be able to advance the conversation on mental health and talk about the complexities of what we discussed today mm -hmm. um, with a fundamental respect and compassion for people who are, are struggling. And I know that there are people out there who wanna to continue to advance this mission. Um, I was inspired by, by the documentary Medi Medicating Normal and I'm uh, you know, so honored that you, you reached out and I had this opportunity to, to talk today about things that I believe in. Um, but if you are also interested in um, trying to advance this conversation, I wanna hear from you um, and I wanna make sure that um, maybe your voice is heard and maybe there's an opportunity on the podcast to share these stories. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a physician out there or you're a prescriber or you're in psychiatry uh, or you're on the medical side of things um, and you have a different perspective and you're seeing something different, then let's be open to debate. Let's have these, these critical conversations. Let's not run away from them. Let's not mute patients who've been harmed. Let's not discount that. Let's eliminate terms like anti-psychiatry and let's create a shared view of science that involves the conversation to improve the well-being of others. And that, that's what I ask, and that's where my passion is. And so hopefully through my treatment, through the center we're developing, and the Radically Genuine podcast, we're going to be able to do that. Yeah, awesome. So you're going to have lots of guests uh, on the podcast, too, is the plan. That's, that's what we hope to do. I think the first thing when you start a podcast is you want to establish an audience so guests are willing to come on. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Phil, and great chatting with you today. And um, I hope everybody listening will go check out your podcast. I'm going to, and um, also on Twitter, because you, you tweet some really great um, things for people to follow and think about and that kind of thing. So we really appreciate your presence there. 
Um, okay, so thanks everybody for joining us today. We're gonna have many more interviews to come. If you haven't seen Medicating Normal yet, you can. You can go to our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch to see uh, community screenings there. You can also check out the events tab on our Facebook page for upcoming events. Um, we currently release new videos on our YouTube channel every Wednesday and Friday at noon central US time. And we'll be having more live interviews here on Facebook Live every week or so. If you would like to support our outreach efforts to bring the film and conversations like these to communities worldwide, you can make a donation at medicatingnormal.com slash donate. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks so much again, Dr. McPhillan, for spending an hour with me. And um, we'll see you soon. Thank right. you. Thank you. Take care.